Hi everyone, my name's Lila. I am a developer advocate for Android uh, at Google. And today we're gonna to be talking about the navigation component. Uh, so hopefully that's why you were in this room. Uh, so welcome to Adventures in Navigation. But before I dive into the component, we wanna talk a little bit about sort of what the space of navigation looks like right now. So um, if you're doing a simple you know, move from one activity to another activity, it's pretty simple. But as soon as you start getting a little bit more complicated, there are a lot of kind of gotchas that you can run into. Uh, testing navigation can be difficult. Uh, fragment transactions have been historically a huge pain. Um, creating a synthetic deep link stack is hard. Even things like passing arguments can get tricky. And there are a lot of generic UI, navigation UI components that require a lot of boilerplate to set up. Um, in addition, another issue is that things weren't consistent. So all of these things that you're seeing up here, people would implement potentially slightly differently. And for something as fundamental as up and back, that can get really confusing for users. Um, so because of this, the first thing we did uh, was talk about, well, what are the principles of navigation that uh, the navigation component is gonna follow and just sort of publish those externally and say kind of what the material design and uh, the team's ideas about uh, navigation are. So I'm gonna go through those principles right now. The first one is that you should have a fixed starting destination. Uh, this is the screen that, you're, uh, that will launch when you click on um, the icon for your app, and it should be kind of thought as the home screen for your app. Here are some examples, um, you know, the Gmail inbox, for example. Importantly, the starting destination is also the last screen that the user uh, should be primed to see before they return to the launcher. Um, so we get this question a lot. If you have a login screen, um, that's usually the first screen that you're gonna see, but then maybe you have a more generic kind of home screen for your app, what should be the starting destination? Well, the starting destination will not include any sort of conditional uh, login flows that you might see, or you know, a tutorial when your user first enters your app. Um, so it'll actually be that kind of uh, start destination screen and not something like a login screen. Okay, and now what you've all been waiting for, uh, the difference between up and back. So historically, um, up uh, had to do with this sort of hierarchical relationship. Um, there would be the thought that you might have something like an inbox, which would be a hierarchical parent of maybe each of the messages. And therefore, if you were able to um, go through email, uh, different emails and create a back stack that way, your back button would take you back through all those screens that you just saw. But if you wanted an easy way to go back up to the parent, that's what the up button was there for. In practice, though, the thing that we saw was that these two buttons look very similar to users, and it was really, really easy for users to get confused. I mean, they're both arrows pointing you know, to the left. Um, and similarly for developers, sometimes there was also some confusion there. So what we decided to do was instead sort of scrap this whole uh, vision of what up and back are and have up, sorry, for, have up be equivalent to back if you are in your own task, so the behavior be exactly the same. Um, the difference is, there's two differences. The first one is if your uh, app is opened by another task, then back will take you back through all the different screens that you've seen, whereas up will take you um, through, again, this sort of like hierarchical uh, back stack. And up can never be used to exit your app. Um, so when you are at your start destination, you'll never see an up arrow there. Uh, if you have a nav drawer, you might see that uh, hamburger menu, um, or you might see nothing at all. All right, so deep linking. So uh, deep linking is the idea of being able to click on a link or a notification and being taken into sort of a subscreen somewhere deep within your app. Um, and the biggest advice for this is that we decided first we're gonna clear whatever back stack that the user already has, and then we're gonna create a kind of realistic back stack. So for example, if I'm deep linked into a uh, email message, I should be able to click up or back to go back to my inbox screen. The way not to do this is what the calendar app currently does. So uh, when you open up a notification for the calendar app, it takes you to your event, which is great, but then there's no easy way to get back to that whole calendar screen. So what we would really like is for uh, it to actually show the up button there instead of a, a sort of closed dialogue. Okay, but the biggest thing is to be consistent. Certainly internally consistent, but also we have these uh, principles so that hopefully as a community we can follow some of these things, at least discuss these things. Um, and then for users, it'll be a lot more clear when they're clicking around on stuff where they're actually gonna go. All right, so now I'm gonna give a very quick tour of the navigation component. Um, as a question, who here has actually used the navigation component before? Okay, so maybe like 30%, so I'll go fast, um, but there's also resources that I'm gonna link to uh, where you can learn more. So uh, the navigation component is a Jetpack component, um, but it also includes tooling. 
For example, uh, if you've watched any of the Google I.O. stuff, you've probably seen the awesome uh, Android Studio editor demoed a few times. So um, in Android Studio, you can visualize um, your paths for your navigation using the navigation component. Another reason might, why you might consider being interested in this is that it gives you a single resource where you define everything that's basically going on with navigation. Um, it helps reduce that boilerplate that I talked as kind of about as kind of like an error region um, at the beginning of this talk. And um, in reducing that boilerplate and helping you set up some of these common navigation UI patterns, it also does it in a way that follows material guidelines and the principles of design, or principles of um, navigation. Okay, so these are the, uh, uh, basically the parts of Gradle that you'll need to import to be able to use all of the navigation component. The first one up there is just the main dependency. The second one is a, uh, the main dependency will let you do basic navigations between two different fragments. The second one is navigation UI, which is um, either uh, static methods or uh, KTX functions that help you set up things like bottom nav and nav drawers. Then we have the, uh, the safe args uh, plugin, which I'll talk about a lot more later, and some test helpers. If you slap a KTX onto the first uh, two of those, you're gonna get idiomatic um, Kotlin extension functions that you can use uh, with the navigation component. So if you're using Kotlin, use KTX. Okay. So the big picture is that there are three basic parts uh, that you need all working in harmony to get your navigation working with the navigation component. The first is a new resource. It's that nav graph that uh, I showed on screen before and I talked a little bit about before. Um, and that's gonna be in your res folder. Similarly, you're gonna need to go into your layouts um, if you're doing sort of the uh, easy path that we give, which is to have a single activity with a bunch of fragments in it. You will add um, a widget called the nav host fragment. And then finally, in your Java or Kotlin code, you're gonna be using a new object called the nav controller to actually do the navigation. Let's zoom in a little bit to the nav graph. So the nav graph is made up of these screens, which are known as destinations. And it's gonna look like this, at least if you're implementing this with fragments. Zooming in a little to one of these destinations, you'll notice that little house. Um, this specifies this destination as a start destination. So you can see that the principles are kind of baked into uh, the nav component. Okay, zoom back out. All of these arrows connecting those destinations are what uh, are called actions. And they basically visualize the different possible paths that a user can take through your app. Okay, so going back to this, if I launch my app, the first place I'm gonna be taken is, of course, the start destination. Um, and that'll load itself up in my nav host fragment. Then, when I wanna navigate from one destination to another destination, I use my nav controller. Uh, the simplest way to do it is to call the navigate uh, command and to pass in an ID that references a specific one of those destinations or a specific one of those actions. If I, for example, uh, pass in an ID for destination, it's kind of like a go-to statement. It just sort of pops me wherever I tell it to take me. Um, but a bit of a safer way to do that is to instead give it an ID for an action, in which case it'll follow the path of that action. Um, so that's very basic navigation using the, uh, using the nav uh, component. If you want to dive into all of that sort of stuff, there's a code lab. Um, also, shameless plug, we just launched uh, the first four lessons of a new developing Android apps and Kotlin Udacity course, and the third lesson is all about navigation, so if you want guided instructional videos and a full sample app, um, that's a great resource too. Okay, now I'm gonna go over some general guidance before uh, jumping into the nitty gritty of a more complicated example of navigation UI. So general guidance, I think I've already uh, sort of hinted at this, but folks will ask us whether they should be using fragment destinations or activity destinations. I did want to say that it's perfectly possible to use activity destinations. In fact, this is an example of what it looks like in your nav graph. The thing is, that looks a little funky, and the reason that looks a little funky is because activity destinations are terminal destinations, meaning that you won't ever have any actions going out of those activity destinations, and they will also have their own navigation graph. So you can imagine that if your app is a bunch of activities, you're not really gonna get that benefit of having a single graph that displays all of uh, the different paths in it. Um, so the way that's posited for thinking about this is that activities actually become sort of a window that have the global navigation for your app, uh, such as a toolbar or an app bar or a bottom nav, and then the actual content is reserved for fragments, um, which are swapped out in that nav host fragment window. So the benefits of this are, first of all, that uh, you can more fully leverage the single navigation graph and have your navigation um, information in one place. But it's also a lot lighter weight to be building fragments as opposed uh, to activities. And finally, um, if you are also using the lifecycle library's view models, 
Um, the, you, you know that you can make a view model for an activity which can be shared a bunch of, about, uh, amongst a bunch of fragments, which, means, uh, which makes it really easy to share data across fragments. Um, now, one of the sticking points for folks not adopting a single activity was up until alpha 6, shared, fragment or shared element transitions weren't supported, but in alpha 6 and beyond, shared element transitions are supported. Um, and they are supported in that you can make this uh, fragment navigator extras object, which kind of lets you link up the two different views for your shared element, and then you pass it in as an extra. That said, all of the other complicated bits of making a shared element transaction work are still complicated bits, uh, but now you can at least actually do it. So if you want 45, 40 minutes or so of um, a good argument of why you might want to consider single activity, I suggest taking a look at this talk uh, that Ian did. He's, he's the guy that wrote navigation uh, component um, about one and a half weeks ago at Android Dev Summit, so um, certainly take a look at that. Okay, so the next question is, should you be using destinations or actions? This is a nav graph with no actions in it, uh, because the actions were the arrows, right? So uh, we highly encourage you to use actions um, in your nav graph, because those arrows also include a lot more information embedded in them. For example, they include, include information about what transition should occur, what arguments should be passed, um, any sort of back stack uh, manipulation that should be happening at that point. In particular, for the last one, um, this starts to bring in the concept of safe args, which is that plugin that I talked about before. And in fact, uh, you should be using actions, but for your uh, navigating, you should actually be using the safe uh, args plugin because it ensures some type safety. So let's see how it does that. So the safe arg, uh, args uh, plugin is a code generation plugin, and it's meant to ensure type safety using your nav graph. Um, so kind of what are the thoughts behind this? Well, IDs are used for a lot of things. And with the introduction of IDs for actions and destinations, um, there are even more IDs out there for you. There are also IDs for menu items and IDs for image views. So if you're to tell your nav controller to navigate to this ID, uh, you're not really quite sure where you're going. Um, now, using sensible naming conventions certainly helps with this. But this still doesn't uh, resolve the possible issue of you telling your nav controller to navigate to an image view and everything blowing up in your face. Therefore, um, SafeArgs helps with this. So uh, it's a plugin, you, know, you add it to your Gradle file, you apply the plugin, and then once you do that and you build, it's gonna generate a lot of code for you. Namely, it's going to, going to generate direction classes for any destination that has actions associated with it, and it will generate these args classes for any destination that it has arguments associated with it. Now in our code, um, this was sort of the old school navigate command where we're passing in the ID, Instead, we can use that directions class that we just generated. So for the location that I'm currently at, the destination that I'm currently at, I get the directions class for that destination, and then that has methods for each of the different actions that come out of it. Um, and then I just need to call uh, navigate with that action. And argument passing is super easy. Um, you just take the action and you can set the argument on it. Um, if the argument has no default value, you're actually forced to set the argument. And then over here on the other side, when you want to actually get the value of the argument, that's where you'll use that generated args class. You'll take the args class, you'll pass in the, the argument bundle that you get, and then you get type safe access to your arguments. Again, uh, prior to this, we had to be passing things with kind of like key value pairs, which is not type safe. You misspell something, that's an issue. Um, so anyways, this is a, a lot easier. All right, so now I'm gonna dive into a slightly more uh, complicated example using um, some different features of navigation. So let's say I have a bunch of screens. Now for some of these screens, I don't want you to be able to look at them unless you have logged in. Therefore, for this subsection of screens, I wanna be able to say if you go onto any of these screens or, um, and you're not logged in or you become not logged in, I'm gonna sort of shunt you up to this logout flow. Uh, so to implement this, the first thing I'd uh, suggest looking into is, are nested graphs. Um, nested graphs are super easy to make. You just select up all the screens in your login flow or whatever other subflow that you have, right click, and click new graph, and then it visually moves it to a new graph that looks like that. Um, note that nested graphs have their own start destination, and when you're navigating to a nested graph, you'll say, hey, go to this nested graph, and it'll automatically put you at the start destination of that nested graph. In XML code, this is what it looks like, so we have all of our regular uh, destinations there and then we can just scroll down and pop in that nested graph. It is another um, graph that has the navigation uh, tag associated with it. It has its own ID and it has its own destinations inside of it. 
Okay, so the next uh, thing that would be really nice is if we had some easy way to get from any screen into, in my app to this uh, login graph. And we can do that using a global action. Now for normal actions that I've been showing you, they have a start destination and end destination. A global action has a destination that it goes to, but it has no starting point. And visually it looks like this. Um, and what this means is that any destination in the graph uh, that has the global action can use the global action, okay? It's not limited to just one destination that can use that action. Um, and in the XML, which you're about to see, this is an action that's not uh, nested within a destination. Uh, so we're looking back at our XML. I'm gonna scroll down past that uh, nested graph that I just made, and we can pop in that global action. Again, it's global because it's not nested within a destination right now. Um, it does have a destination that it goes to, which is the ID for the nested login flow. So this is an action that any of the other destinations can use, it'll take you to your login flow. All right, the next thing to consider is leveraging that activity view model. Um, so again, uh, if you've used view models, they can be associated with fragments, but they can also be associated uh, by the act activity that owns those fragments, and then any of those fragments in that activity can get data from that uh, shared view model. So uh, for login, you might consider um, adding the two pieces of information that you need to make that decision about whether the user should be going to that login flow. And those two pieces are a Boolean about whether uh, the user is logged in or not, which updating that will be dependent on however you're doing login. And the other one is uh, the current destination ID, like where am I on the graph right now? And using those two pieces of information, you can decide whether it's time to shoot them over to login. Um, so to keep track of the current destination ID, you can use something known as an on-navigated listener. Uh, so on-navigated listeners are listeners that you attach to your nav controller, and then whenever your nav controller does a navigation action, it'll call that listener, and whatever code is in it will, of course, run. Um, importantly, it includes information about the current destination that you're going to. Um, Navigation UI, which we'll be talking about next, heavily uses navigation uh, listeners to be able to keep the um, UI elements that it's maintaining uh, up to date with whatever destination you're on. So for example, the bottom nav has the correct thing uh, highlighted because it, it uses a navigation uh, on navigated listener. And finally, just a you know, reminder, remember to remove your listener. What does this look like in code? It's pretty simple. So um, to make a navigation listener, uh, I just you call the, um, I just construct it. Um, this one here is taking that view model and it's updating the uh, live data that stores the current destination, and then I'm adding it to the nav controller. And of course, you also have to remember to remove it from the, end, uh, the nav controller. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, backstack manipulation and how this works uh, with the navigation component. It uses an attribute called pop2. So here is my login um, subgraph. And let's say that as part of login, I uh, also have an ability to sign up for a new account. When I sign up for a new account, maybe I'll pass through all of these different screens, and when I'm done signing up for the account, I don't want the user to be able to hit the back button to go through um, these like interstitial uh, sign up screens that they just completed. So what I would really like to do is when I finish signing them up, be able to pop these off the back stack and not include them in the back stack. Um, so it's, uh, you can use pop up to. So instead of giving this uh, action a destination, I'm gonna give it this pop up to attribute, and I give it a location to pop itself up to. Any screens that are in between me at my current destination and that uh, destination that I'm popping up to will be removed off of the back stack. And that pop up to inclusive just determines whether I'm also popping off uh, that destination that I'm navigating to. Okay, so visually doing that, it would look like this, and I come over here. That same action, so it pops off any and all intermediate screens. That same action can be used um, no matter how many interstitial screens that you have. So even if I have four uh, things I wanted to pop off the back stack, that exact same action would pop all those things uh, off the back stack and take me back to the login fragment. Finally, maybe I want some way to say, hey, when I'm done with navigation, just pop everything related to navigation off the stack and take me back to wherever I was before. To do this, you can combine two of the concepts that we've talked about, a global action with a pop up to. Uh, so here's a picture of that here. So I have my uh, two navigation graphs, the outer one and the inner nested one, and I have this global action um, that pops off everything in the nested graph. And it does that because my pop up to behavior is giving the ID of the nested graph, and they'll pop up every, uh, that'll basically pop everything in this graph off. 
And wherever I happen to be on the stack before this is where I'll go back to um, after that global action occurs. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Navigation UI, which is sort of uh, the second library that's included in all of this. So Navigation UI uh, includes either Java uh, static methods for Java or Kotlin extension functions for Kotlin uh, for common Navigation UIs, such as um, any kind of bar that you can think of, so action bar, toolbar, collapsible uh, toolbar, um, implementing the up button correctly, overflow menus, navigation drawers, and bottom nav. So I'm gonna give a little menu example first because it is uh, possibly the easiest to set up. So you got your menu. Um, already, you are making a menu XML resource. The important thing to get this all to work is for each of those items that you wanna do in navigation, you take whatever the ID is and you have it match the ID of the destinations in your nav graph, okay? Once you do that, all you have to do is override, um, well, you're already gonna be overriding on option item selected, and you can just call this handy uh, method here on the item, on nav destination selected, you pass in the nav controller, and if that is an item that has a um, destination ID that matches something in your nav graph, it'll navigate you there. Um, of course, if you have items in your uh, menu that don't navigate or do something else that's kind of funky, uh, that'll return false, and then you can uh, handle that as you will. All right, so bottom nav, I would say, is the next easiest thing to implement. Um, bottom nav is useful if you have three to five sort of top-level, globally accessible destinations in your app. So bottom nav is super easy to set up. Um, you still need to set up, you still need to add it to your layout. So you need to add the bottom nav view to your layout as normal. And then you need to set up uh, your menu for bottom nav in the same way that we just set up uh, the menu XML for uh, the overflow menu. So the, the IDs need to match uh, destination IDs in your nav graph. But once you do that, all you need to call is that one liner there, uh, which takes your bottom nav view and calls setup with nav controller, pass in the nav controller, and then you get all of this. Uh, navigation UI will handle your actual navigation for you, so you don't need, uh, need to be calling navigate, uh, nav controller navigate anything. Um, it'll update the uh, bottom nav state using an unnavigated listener, um, and it'll also take care of backstack. Now you might be wondering, what do you mean by take care of backstack? What will my backstack look like? Um, so even though you have these uh, bottom nav destinations that are sort of siblings, one of those is likely gonna be a start destination. And in this case, um, I'm having it be my title screen. So if I start off on my title fragment, this is what my back stack's gonna look like. If I then uh, go over to my rules uh, fragment, my back stack will look like this with the rules fragment on top. Let's say that I navigate around within the rules fragment a little bit, and I add another thing to my back stack. When I go uh, and click on the about, it's actually gonna clear um, everything in sort of the rules um, sub backstack off the top of my backstack. The title fragment will remain on the backstack because, um, because it's the start destination and the start destination is always something that you see before navigating out of the app. And my backstack will end up looking like this. So essentially as you're switching between not, uh, bot different bottom uh, navs, it's gonna be clearing out your backstack every time. Okay, that's the default behavior anyways. Um, and it was following, Ian had a conversation with the material design people and, and that's uh, what came out of that. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how up and the different toolbars work. So navigation UI has support for again, toolbar, action bar, collapsing toolbar. Um, and it also uh, really helps with dealing with what should that little up icon look like in the quarter, especially if you're using a nav drawer layout and you might need to swap that out with a hamburger icon. Um, and it also updates the toolbar labels. So all of this stuff it helps you with. Um, to be able to do that, it has a concept, uh, so let's just take out all the toolbars for those different screens. It has this concept of top level destination. Um, top le de level destination is really only used for saying, hey, I, I do or I don't want the uh, up button to appear on this. So if it's a top level destination, um, the up button will not appear, but if it's not a top level destination, then the up button will appear. Um, it is possible to say that you want all of these destinations to be top level destinations. Just keep in mind that you still have only one start destination. So this won't change anything about the back stack, but it will change whether the up button appears or does not appear. Um, so to do that, you use a class called app bar configuration. If you want the default behavior where the only top de level destination is your start destination, then you just pass in the nav graph and you're done. If you want the behavior where you have uh, different destinations that you select be sort of considered top level destinations, you pass in the IDs for those destinations. 
Once you, have your, um, once you have your app bar configuration, you can configure the up button, either with a fragmented toolbar combo or a activity and action uh, bar combo. So this is the fragmented toolbar. Um, we've already, sorry, just up here, we've already uh, configured our app bar configuration. And then all I need to do is get a, access to my toolbar and call that same setup with nav controller method. I pass in the nav controller, and importantly, I also pass in the app bar configuration because it needs to know about that to be able to correctly handle the up button for you. Uh, activity plus toolbar, or sorry, action bar looks pretty similar to that. Again, I make my app bar configuration, and then instead I call this setup action bar with nav controller, again passing in the nav controller and the app bar configuration. Um, just keep in mind that if you're doing this with activity, you also have to override on support navigation up, and you have to use this nav controller dot, uh, dot navigate up method, again, passing in that app bar configuration. Okay, navigation drawer. Uh, navigation drawers are used if you happen to have more than five sort of top level destinations, and uh, they can use, be used for multiple levels of destination hierarchy, uh, and they offer quick navigation between destinations that might sort of not be on the same level of hierarchy or are more uh, are less related than if they were to bottom nav together. Um, some things about the navigation drawer implementation. So it has the same back stack behavior, meaning that it's going to clear out your stack as you're uh, switching between um, different destinations. Um, you need to manage. Uh, you need to sort of help it manage the up button for you. Um, and it, uh, just keep in mind that if you navigate to, if you've implemented a navigation drawer but you're on a screen with an up button, you can see the navigation drawer by swiping out from the left. Okay, so looking at the toolbars really quickly, my top level destination, instead of not having anything there, is gonna have that nav drawer icon or um, hamburger menu icon, um, and then uh, my other non-top level destinations will have the, back, or the up button. Um, so setup for a nav drawer looks like this. The first thing we do is that we set up our app bar configuration. The one difference to note is that I'm passing in my drawer layout to this. Then I call setup action bar with nav controller, passing in my app bar configuration. This is exactly the same as you saw in a few slides before. Um, and this is setting up the up button. And then this sets up the actual uh, nav view so that when you click on the different items in that menu, it sends you somewhere. So I've set up my uh, up button and I've also set up the ability to click on different um, uh, icons in the, the navigation view and go different places. And then finally, again, um, override on support navigate up. Now some folks ask, uh, so obviously I have not mentioned tabs, and some folks ask, well, why aren't tabs included in this? And because actually um, tabs are not doing navigation in the sense that navigation component thinks about navigation. So uh, navigation is switching where you are, but it's also modifying the back stack. And uh, material design guidelines say that tabs should not have uh, modified back stack, and therefore tabs are not included. Um, so, especially for the thing I was saying about the backstack being cleared um, when you're switching between things in the bottom nav and the nav drawer, um, you might be wondering about, well, is there anything I can do about this? Um, so, you know, all the navigation UI code is out there, um, and you are welcome to write your own navigation UI implementations. Uh, obviously, deviate with purpose. Um, for this particular issue, there's actually a bug filed on it, and the team is aware of it, and is trying to think of sort of different solutions to potentially have different backstacks for those different um, bottom nav destinations, uh, but that's just something to keep aware of. So if we were to actually go and explore navigation UI, uh, we could see all the code for setup with nav controller. Um, so right here, it's doing a lot of stuff. Um, but one of the things it's, it's doing is it's taking my bottom navigation uh, view and it's setting a listener on it for whatever an item is clicked. And whatever an item is clicked, this um, on, navigation, on nav destination selected uh, method is called with the value true. And it's actually this uh, value of true which determines the behavior to clear everything up uh, back to the start destination. So you know you could dig into this stuff and potentially write your own implementations for this. If you have a particular case, you could write your own uh, nav UI-esque code. Um, and get inspiration from that. All right, deep linking. So I'm gonna separate uh, this into two sort of different categories. We have explicit deep linking and we have implicit deep linking. So explicit deep linking is the term that I'm using for when you have um, something that is explicitly referring to a particular destination in your app, um, such, and it's done via pending intent, such as if you're clicking on a, navigate, a notification to get into your app. This is really easy to create uh, with the navigation component. Um, there's a nav deep link builder. You just pass in the graph, you pass in the ID of where you want to go to, and you say create. 
the fanciness that it's doing for you is it's managing the back stack for you when you actually click on that uh, notification and go into um, the deep link in your app. Um, so the default behavior that it'll do is it'll actually clear out whatever was on the back stack before, because that's part of our principles of navigation. And then it'll put on the top of the stack the destination that you just deep linked into, followed by the start destination. So that's what your stack is gonna look like. Um, if instead, let's say I have a nested, uh, one or more nested nav graphs, in this case a nested nav graph, what it's gonna do is it'll clear out the stack and then it'll put the, des the destination that you're deep linking to on the top of the stack, followed by the start destination for the nested nav graph, followed by the start destination for the outer nav graph. And this is kind of how the back stack is determined for you. Um, so theoretically, if you wanted to manipulate the back stack, you could nest things in different ways. Okay, um, implicit deep linking is sort of the idea that you can uh, have a URI, deep, URI uh, deep link somewhere into your app. For example, I'm on a website and I want to view my uh, user profile and it takes me over to my app. This is also very simple. Um, it is an attribute associated with your destinations that you set. So in our XML, I have this fragment destination here and I'm literally just saying, uh, adding a deep link tag with the URI that I want to deep link into my app. And what's even cooler, is that I can also include uh, arguments within that. I just have a wildcard for my argument and it automatically gets uh, extracted. Um, so another thing that was a little bit annoying about uh, deep links was that you had to write these long intent filters. Um, but because your nav graph knows all this information, all you need to do in the Android manifest is let it know about your nav graph and then it will generate the intent filters for you. Okay, which uh, brings us to a discussion of instant apps. So um, the reason it does is because one of the ways to get into an instant app, which is, uh, is to click on a, a link. Um, just as a reminder, instant apps are native Android experiences, but they require no installation. Okay, so I actually had um, maybe 15 minutes of this talk, 20 minutes of this talk, that was all about how to potentially get um, navigation working with instant apps. Um, now, this is working with what is, at this point, somewhat of a legacy instant app uh, model structure, uh, where you'd have an installable app, an instant app. One of the things that's still applicable is that for your deep links, you can add this little tag here um, with auto verify true, and that'll add the auto verify true attribute to your intent filters, which is um, an important step to getting um, instant apps working with uh, URL access. Um, but the, uh, the long part of this uh, um, talk before about instant apps included all this stuff with using uh, implicit activity deep links and overriding nav graphs, and it was fairly complicated. The new world of instant apps is actually highly related to the Android app bundle. So uh, for those of you not in the know, the Android app bundle is a new publishing format for Android. Um, instead of building an APK, you build an app bundle. Uh, this allows Play to give you a lot of size savings because it can sort of piece out the parts uh, that the user needs and just send those down to the user. Uh, the thing is that with the app bundle, the instant app story becomes a lot cleaner because in your Android manifest, you could just say, hey, my app that is already modularized for the app bundle, I'm gonna just put this tag there and that's gonna uh, also allow it to be delivered as an instant app. Um, so you don't need uh, the installable and instant app structure um, and your architecture actually becomes a lot simpler. So I guess the real question about navigation is how does navigation work with uh, modularization and dynamic features? So question number one is if you have a multi-module project, can you use navigation? Um, so we looked into this. So um, here is Sunflower and we split it out into two different uh, modules. Sunflower is sort of the base uh, generic sample app for Jetpack. It has an app module, a feature module. Now, um, if you start, uh, so each of those modules is gonna have different nav graphs, and the nav graphs are gonna refer to uh, destinations that are not within their module. And if you actually start trying to do this, you're gonna see these sort of worrisome things, like, you know, it won't be able to preview your screens. It's gonna be a lot of red in your nav graphs, and you would think it wouldn't compile, but it actually does. This is a sample, or this is a video of that app running. Um, and the reason for that is because it is act Fragment Navigator is actually using um, reflection to look up at runtime whether uh, the class is there. And um, the class is there if, if, again, we're not using dynamic modules, we're just having a multi-module app. So it is able to, um, it, it doesn't crash at runtime. The thing is, um, if my classes, or if my Fragment destinations might or might not be there, what happens? So if I'm sort of dynamically getting um, classes and different destinations uh, on the fly. 
So what I do wanna say is that at the moment, you can uh, dynamically load in uh, navigation graphs. So all the sample code that you see is likely gonna have the navigation graph statically um, loaded up in the nav host fragment, but you can load it up in, in your Java or Kotlin code. And this is an example of this here, and I'm using some conditional logic to decide which navigation graph to load. You can also build navigation graphs dynamically. There's in fact a whole uh, Kotlin DSL for doing this. Um, here's an example here where I've taken one graph, the garden graph, and I'm adding all of the destinations from the plant graph to that. Unfortunately, at the moment, um, Fragment Navigator internals prevent uh, full uh, dynamic apps from working because actually when uh, you inflate that graph, it does a check to make sure that all of uh, those destinations are actually there. And even if you have the code or the logic in your app to be like, oh, um, you know, never navigate me here if the destination doesn't exist, uh, it's still gonna uh, crash on inflate. Um, so there's sort of two paths. One is you could write your own navigator. But the end goal is, and Ian's talked about this before, is to make having a dynamic feature something as easy as adding a different destination to your nav graph. So this is sort of future view, uh, but you, know, you have a bunch of fragment destinations and you'd just be able to add a feature as another destination there. All right, so gosh, I am so sorry guys, I talked so fast, this talk was taking 45 minutes before, I guess you get a little bit more time. Anyways, so uh, if you wanna jump over and continue the adventure right now, uh, there's a bunch of documentation out there for you, reference docs, uh, again, both the code lab and the Audacity course that I mentioned, and also samples. So we have the uh, Sunflower sample, which is kind of a holistic, all of Jetpack sample, uh, architecture component samples, the two um, subsamples in that sample directory that contain navigation are the navigation basic sample and a more complicated uh, GitHub browser sample. And everybody's phones are going down, so I'm gonna go to the next one, um, <laughs> which is the uh, release notes. So uh, we're still in alpha. We really hope to get to beta soon. Um, but every time a new release comes out, bug fixes occur, uh, and so this is a really good place to kind of keep checking back up. Um, also, there's the issue tracker there, so um, if there are particular things you're wondering about, you can look up uh, the bugs or feature requests there in the issue tracker and follow those, or you can request your own. And uh, the source uh, is also there in case you wanna look into things like uh, NavUI that I mentioned before, and we have a stack overflow tag. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure presenting today, and I will be off to the side for questions. <laughs>